2. Tracing the origins of life to a moment prior to life will result in paradoxes. Saul Spiegelman's discoveries concerning RNA show how you can't draw a rigid, narrow boundary between life and non-life. In order for life forms to begin, there had to be a strange, paradoxical, pre-living life made of RNA and self-replicating crystals, possibly silicate crystals. How strange that silicon is the element in question. So in a way, your great-great-great-grandmother was indeed a robot, as, as Daniel Dennett says. RNA world abolishes the idea of a palpable, fetishized life substance, the sort nature philosophy imagines as urschleim, a kind of sentient gel. Curiously, the fantasy thing of idealist biology turns out to be this existential substance, as if idealism depended for its coherence on some metaphysical materiality. RNA world, by contrast, is structured like a language. At bottom, it's a set of empty formal relationships. This is the basis of a genuinely materialist biology. 3. Drawing distinctions between life and non-life is strictly impossible, yet unavoidable. This brings us to our third paradox. If pre-living life is necessary for imagining the origins of life, then it's also the case that in the present moment, the moment of life as such, the life-non-life distinction is also untenable. When we start to think about life, we worry away at the distinction between nature and artifice. So, for example, um, um, recently there have been some new, some new discoveries concerning beings called virions. Now, these are beings that are ten times smaller than a virus, and they're really just a circle of RNA code. Um, they're very, very ancient beings, um, and they sort of affect um, our transcription machinery um, they, 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 they do things to our RNA and our DNA um, at, at, at an extraordinary, almost sub-microscopic level. Um, they can't really be said to be alive. I, th I think also, you know, a virus, technically, if you think a virus is alive, I mean, a virus is a, is a huge crystal, really. It's a macromolecular um, crystal that, that, that basically tells your DNA to make copies of itself. So, so if you think that that's alive, then you must also think a computer virus is alive, because a computer virus is also a piece of code that tells other bits of code to make copies of itself. Um, so you can do that, but you, you have to concede then that computer viruses are also alive on that definition. 4. Differentiating between one species and another is never absolute. This is the lesson of Darwinism. Darwinism is truly one of the great humiliations of the human up there or down there with Copernicus, Marx and Freud. Um, species, um, this is the origin of species here, and the funny thing is, of course, is that there's no, there's no origin as such. Species is a label that can be only applied retroactively. There are no species as such, says Darwin, no species to be, no point in evolutionary history to which we can point and say there is the origin of Homo sapiens. So even though happily they've discovered a lemur that's 47 million years old that has something like our fingernails and so on and opposable thumbs you, 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 you can't definitively draw a line and say that's the beginning of people um, Darwin really undermines the categories of species variation and even monstrosity um, so that they all kind of deconstruct in, into each other and um, none has priority it's just an amazing text I, I don't think modern humanists have anything to be afraid of from, from, from reading Darwin, which we should, because I don't think that we're nearly up to speed with, with, with half of what he said. So Darwin declared um, in a notebook that his observations of mockingbirds and turtles might undermine the stability of species. Well, that's the understatement of the, of the millennium, isn't it? Five, there is no outside of the system of life forms. Once life gets going, We've already shown how thinking this origin is practically impossible. Everything else becomes linked with it. This is what most of us mean when we think ecologically, that everything is connected to everything else. There are strong metaphysical versions of this consequence, such as Guy and Holism, and weak reductionist ones, and I'm on, I'm on the weak reductionist side. This point is actually very profound because it also implies that there is no environment as such. That what we're talking about today is the phenotypical expression of DNA, and, and here I've been greatly influenced by Richard Dawkins's book, The Extended Phenotype. I think the ecological thought, in a way, is, um, you know, imagine if Levinas and, and Dawkins ever met in a dark alley. They, they'd kill each other, wouldn't they? But 
um, my book, I'm, I'm trying to sort of provide the atmosphere, suitable lighting or whatever, nice food, you know, um, good music, in which Levinas and Dawkins could go on a nice blind date and actually hit it off. And, I, and I'm using Dawkins precisely not Gould and Lewontin, because I think that, you know, um, we ought to read these people who seem um, conservative um, to us, and um, that if we can find progressive ways of looking at what they're doing, then then how much easier it will be to find progressive um, philosophy and politics in in you know work that's supposedly further to the left, further to the left of that. Um, and I like the sort of ruthless philistine reductionism. I've got a big soft spot for that. He said provocatively. Anyway, your DNA doesn't stop expressing itself at the ends of your fingers. A, be a beaver's DNA doesn't stop expressing itself at the ends of its whiskers, but at the ends of its dam. A spider's DNA is expressed in its web. The environment, then, from the perspective of the life sciences, is nothing but the phenotypical expression of DNA code. This includes oxygen, anaerobic bacterial excrement, and it includes iron ore, a byproduct of archaic metabolic processes. You probably drove or flew here today using crushed, liquefied dinosaur bones. You're walking on top of hills and mountains of fossilized animal bits. Most of your house dust is your skin. The environment is beginning to look like a not very successful upgrade of the old-fashioned term nature. <laughs>